All right, let's get started, inshallah. In alhamdulillah, nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'hdihu wa nasta'khiruhu wa na'udhu billahi min shuroori anfusina wa sayyati amalina may yahdi allahu falamudullah wa may yudlul falahadiya lah wa ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh So this week, uh, we talk about seasons of goodness or seasons of khair. The, the Arabic word is khair which is translated in English roughly to the word goodness. Um, and really what we want to discuss is what are the seasons of goodness? And also we want to touch base that Ramadan is the greatest season of goodness. And also that we want to be aware of fake or innovative uh, seasons of goodness. And inshallah, we will, uh, from that, we will... Uh, uh, try to understand or like have a better understanding of uh, our deen inshallah so sometimes shaitan deceives us through our own selves or through others so that's why we always need to go back to the basics what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran what did the teaching of the prophet the, the authentic sunnah tell us what did the companions uh, understand and how they implemented implemented the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the teaching of the Prophet sallallahu What did the scholars say and how did they explain a certain aspect of our deen? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in uh, Surah Al-Hashr, وَمَا آتَاكُمُ الرَّسُولُ فَخُذُوهُ وَمَا نَهَاكُمْ عَنْهُ فَانْتَهُوا وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ إِنَّ اللَّهَ شَرِيدُ الْعِقَابَ Whatever the Prophet sallallahu sallam gives you, then take it. And whatever he forbids you from, leave it and fear Allah and be conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Surely Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, um, has a severe punishment. So surely the, the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a severe punishment. Now, in another ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Muhammad, Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, ati'u Allah wa ati'u rasul, wa la tubatilu a'malakum. O believers, obey Allah and the Messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and do not let your um, deeds be in vain. Do not let your deeds be nullified, basically. So, how can one nullify their own deeds? Is, for example, if they come up with something new in the religion, they think they are doing something good, but they are inventing something new in the religion. So they are doing deeds that are completely nullified. So when we are looking at matters of ibadah, matters of worship, then we look, we look for clear and ambiguous directions from our deen, from the Quran, from the authentic hadith and the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Why? The number one reason is this ayah, is we don't want to nullify our deeds, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says in Surah An-Nur, verse 54, قُلْ أَطِيعُ اللَّهَ وَأَطِيعُ الرَّسُولِ فَإِن تَوَلَّوْ فَإِنَّمَا عَلَيْهِ مَا حُمِّلْ وَعَلَيْكُمْ مَا حُمِّلْتُمْ That obey Allah and obey the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But if you turn away, then he is only responsible for his duty, which is delivering the message. And you are responsible for yours, which is, did you listen to the, the message of the Prophet or not? Did you implement what he said or not? He's not re responsible that you do implement his teachings or not. You are responsible for that. He's only responsible for delivering the message as he got it, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And if you obey him, you will be rightly guided. If you obey the Prophet وسلم, then you will be rightly guided. The messenger's duty is only to deliver the message clearly. So the, if, if we had any doubt, this ayah spells it clearly, that the, message, the, the responsibility of the Prophet وسلم, his duty is to deliver the message. Whatever happens after that is really our responsibility. Whether we implement, whether we obey, whether we go astray, it's our responsibility. Then we want to close the door of the shaitan. Because sometimes one of the doors of the shaitan is I am doing it out of love. My love for Allah, for the messenger, is leading me to do this extra act 
that have no basis in the deen. So Allah first tells us in Surah Al-Ma'idah, الْيَوْمَ أَكْمَلْتُ لَكُمْ دِينَكُمْ وَأَتْمَمْتُ عَلَيْكُمْ نِعْمَةِ وَرَضِيْتُ لَكُمْ الْإِسْلَامَ دِينَةِ Today I have perfected your faith for you, completed my favor upon you, and chosen Islam as your way. So in other words, there is nothing we can make up that can complete the deen because the complete is the deen is complete. There is nothing extra that we can do that the Prophet ﷺ didn't do that we can attribute to the deen because the deen is complete, the religion is complete, the acts of worship are complete, the teachings are complete. So there is nothing missing there. And if we come up with something and we say, this is I this is part of the deen, even though the Prophet ﷺ didn't do it, it's as if we are accusing the Prophet ﷺ of not giving us the full deen, that he left some parts, sallallahu alayhi wa and didn't deliver them to us. And we seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from, from saying so or thinking so. Then, as I said, out of love, the claim is, I'm doing this out of love for Allah, for the Prophet ﷺ. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shuts the door in Surah Ali Imran, verse 31, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if you love Allah, قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهَ فَاتَّبِعُونِي يُحْبِبْكُمُ اللَّهُ وَيَخْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ وَاللَّهُ غَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ Say, O Prophet, if you sincerely love Allah, then follow me. So tell them, Ya Rasulullah, tell them, O Prophet of Allah, if you sincerely love Allah, then you need to confirm that with actions. And that action is to follow the Prophet ﷺ. And if you follow the Prophet ﷺ, then Allah will love you and will forgive your sins. For Allah is all forgiving and Allah is the most merciful. So it's very clear that your love for Allah has to be followed up with actions. And that action is to follow the teaching of the Prophet ﷺ. That's the confirmation. That's how we can confirm that we are loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We cannot claim we love someone if we don't obey them, if we don't follow them. Now, the thing is, sometimes you might come up with the argument and say, you know, I, you know, I love my parents, for example. But sometimes I don't obey them because I think maybe like they are not, they don't understand the deen properly. You know, you're debating with them a matter, matter of the religion and you know the authentic way of doing it. And they don't know, they didn't have the right teaching. So they tell you do this. You say, no, like, I'm not going to obey you on this because I know. The hadith XYZ in Bukhari and Muslim says this. So I love them, but I'm disobeying them. Here, the point here is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we know, we have no doubt, there is no uh, chance, you know, it's unequivocal in the deen that Allah and the Messenger would lead us to something wrong, would give us a command for something wrong. So here, the, the point that is being made is that if we love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then we have to follow the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because whatever the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is telling us is coming directly from Allah. It's pure. There is no imperfection in it. This is pure teaching from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, with that being said, we want to delve into the topic of season of goodness. So we established the first part, which is we want to check and go back to basics. We want to check the source of our teaching. The, te the teaching, the dean is complete. And there is nothing that we can add that was not conveyed by the Prophet ﷺ. There's nothing we can make up and attribute to the dean because the dean is complete. And then if we claim to love the Prophet ﷺ, and that's why we're doing X, or we love the Prophet وسلم, and we're doing why, we can only truly love the Prophet وسلم, and love Allah if we follow the Prophet, وسلم, the teaching, the true teaching of the Prophet. وسلم. So that's even established by the Quran. So, what are seasons of goodness? There are special times and places that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala designated where more rewards are warranted for good deeds and the opposite for bad deeds meaning a, a higher or more severe punishment is for uh, is warranted for sins so for example in terms of places the praying in mecca is equivalent to 100000 
Salah somewhere else. Praying in the uh, the the uh, um, uh, the mosque of the Prophet وسلم, Same thing. A thousand salah somewhere else. How about the times? So there are times in the year that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala designated that more rewards are warranted in those times. For example, the easiest one is the first ten days of the Hijjah. The Prophet وسلم, says there are no ten days. There are no day, days greater and more beloved to Allah than these 10 days of the Hijjah. So increase in them your declaration of the oneness, takbir, that Allah, Allahu Akbar, la ilaha illallah, wa tahleel, your exaltation of him and your praise of him, at tahmeed, so alhamdulillah. So Allah, la ilaha illallah, alhamdulillah, wallahu akbar. So these are acts of worship that are Recommended by the Prophet ﷺ in these days. Another example is the month of Ramadan. This is the greatest season of um, khair, of goodness. The Prophet ﷺ in many ahadith highlighted that during those 30 days or 30 nights, the rewards are immeasurable. Whoever fasts the month of Ramadan and follows it with six days of Shawwal, it will be as if he fasted the entire year. And then the Prophet ﷺ says, whoever fasts Ramadan, the month of Ramadan, out of faith, then all of his sins will be forgiven. And then whoever makes Qiyam, night prayer, during the month of Ramadan, out of sincere faith and hoping for the reward of Allah, then all his previous sins will be forgiven. And then Laylat al-Qadr, one night in Ramadan, then the reward of it is equivalent or more than 83 years of worship, of continuous worship. So there are many, many, many blessings, many goodness, many opportunities for uh, gaining extra rewards in the month of Ramadan. We also know the day of Ashura, where the Prophet ﷺ told us that if you fast, then your uh, sins will will be expiated so this is a one day event one day uh, where we could basically benefit we could take a huge av advantage of extra rewards on those days right so this is this is to tell us that there are specific times as we said there are specific places like in haram in in masjid al-nabawi but there are specific uh, uh, times where there is extra rewards that the more you do good deeds, then the more you will uh, reap up or reap the rewards. And that's why in those times, we are encouraged to race, to hasten, to gain more rewards from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Ali Imran, وَسَارِعُوا إِلَىٰ مَغْفِرَةٍ مِّنْ رَبِّكُمْ وَجَنَّةٍ عَرْضُهَا كَعَرْضِ عَرْضُهَا that hasten towards forgiveness from your Lord and a paradise that is as vast that is as vast as the uh, heavens and the earth prepared for those mindful of Allah. So this ayah is not specific to those seasons of, of goodness but more so it applies more so to those specific times. That's where we need to strive more. That's why we should really take advantage. We should really make up for lost time. But the question that begs itself, what about the current month of Rajab? Some of you might have received messages on social media, um, you know, and on your feeds saying the month of Rajab has started and it's a blessed month, it's a sacred month and so on. So what about this month? I personally saw so many videos coming up on my uh, feed where it's saying this is specifically in the beginning of the week saying this is the dua of Rajab. These are the virtues and the blessings of Rajab. So what about it? The question is, is it a special month? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah At-Tawbah verses 36. 
إن عدة الشهور عند الله إثنى عشر شهرا في كتاب الله يوم خلق السماوات والأرض منها أربعة حرم ذلك الدين القيم فلا تظلم فيهن أنفسكم Indeed, the number of months ordained by Allah is twelve in Allah's record since the day he created the heavens and the earth, of which four are sacred months. So four of those months, so four of the, out of the twelve, are sacred months. So which, what are these months? How do we know which one they are? This is uh, clarified in an authentic hadith of the Prophet ﷺ where the Prophet ﷺ is detailing as well that the year is 12 months and then we have four sacred months. One of them is Rajab and it's separate and three of them are contiguous and those are Dhul Qada, Dhul Hijjah and the month of Muharram. So this is established by the Prophet ﷺ. He, he specified which month they are. So the question here is what is special about the month of Rajab specifically? And what can you and cannot do in the sacred month? First of all, why these months are called sacred? Because um, fighting was forbidden during these months, except for self-defense. And one of the biggest reasons for it is, for example, if you think about the month of Dhul Qada, Dhul Hijjah, and Muharram, those are months, Dhul Hijjah is in between those two months of Dhul Qada and Muharram. So people, a lot of people will be moving and traveling to perform Hajj. So forbidding fight, fights during that period will secure the Hajjah. So think about it. Now it's easy. You could fly within, you know, few hours. Before it used to take weeks to reach Mecca. So you want the area surrounded. You want the whole area to be safe and secure, so that people can leave weeks ahead and then come back weeks after without um, fearing for their lives. Now the thing is that I want to go back to the area where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that there are 12 months and then four of them are sacred. So what about them? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, ذَلِكَ الدِّينُ الْقَيِّمُ فَلَا تَظْلِمُوا فِيهِنَّ أَنفُسَكُمْ That is the right way. So do not wrong one another during these month, months. So the, the point here is you hear this ayah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us there are 12 months, four of them are sacred. Then you would think, what about them, Ya Allah? Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replies to us and says, do not wrong one another during these months. In another explanation or translation, so do not do injustice to yourself during them. So there is the meaning that do not wrong one another, but also there is the meaning do not wrong yourself in these months. So let's start and, and see what you cannot do in the month of, of, of Rajab. What are the things that you cannot do in the month of Rajab? The six books of Hadith do not include any Hadith about special acts of worship in the month of Rajab. In other words, there is no Hadith that details, that's authentic, that's in any of the six books of hadith that specifies a specific act of worship. The fasting that can be done in the month of Rajab is the same that you would do in any other month. In other words, month, if you're fasting Mondays or Thursdays, then that's the fasting that you carry on in the month of Rajab. You could um, fast the middle of the month, the 13th and the 14th and 15th, right? But there is no special, you know, day that is specific fasting for the month of Rajab that you wouldn't do in another month. So there is no spe special fasting on the first day, on the 15th, or on the 27th, or on the first Jum'ah. That's not, there is no authentic hadith for that. There is no special salah on any given day of the month. If you do nafila, extra voluntary salah, 
you do the same extra voluntary salah that you would do in any other month. So there is nothing that is pertaining to the month of Rajab that is special that you would only do in the month of Rajab. Whether you would do on a daily basis in the month of Rajab or you would do you know, on a specific day on the 27th or something that you only do in the month of Rajab. No hadith, not, nothing authentic. So uh, uh, one salah that is called Salat al raghaib is one of the innovations that is related or that is introduced in the month of Rajab that has no basis whatsoever in the hadith of the Prophet And that's why we wanted to establish from the beginning of the halaqa that we want to go back to the basics. That we want to get our um, deen, our worship from the Quran and from the authentic sunnah of the Prophet There is no special night or day. For example, the night of Al-Isra and Al-Mi'raj, the night journey, did not happen on the 27th of Rajab. And this is a common misconception that is tooted and on, on a wide basis. We, we don't know the month of Al-Isra and Al-Mi'raj, not, not let alone the day. So the scholars, the, the point is that the, um, the Islamic calendar started at the time of Umar ibn Khattab. So that's when we started knowing about what is called a Hijri year. So before that, they were not writing the dates. They were not basically um, uh, writing specific dates for specific events. So specifically, the night journey, Al-Isra, where the Prophet ﷺ traveled by night from uh, Mecca to uh, Jerusalem, and then Al-Araj, which is where he was ascended to the seventh heaven, we don't know the month. We know it happened 1.5 to 2 years before the Prophet ﷺ went to Medina, before the Hijrah, before the immigration of the Prophet ﷺ. But we don't know the month. So let alone the day. So if somebody comes to you and says it happened on the 27th of Rajab, then that's inconceivable. Now, the scholars, they even talk that if, if there is any month that maybe there may be some some consensus, and subhanAllah, that's not even a strong consensus. It could be Dhul Qadr. So it has no relation with the month of Rajab. So if we take with that, let's say it's Dhul Qadr, we don't know the day. There is nothing, no basis. We cannot say it's the first or the second or the 10th or the 27th. So if somebody starts saying, you know, let's start talking about Al-Isra and Al-Ma'raj in the month of Rajab, and then let's do something special on the 27th of Rajab, that has no basis whatsoever in the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. There is nothing special on the first day of Rajab or on the first Jum'ah of Rajab. Nothing. There is no special dua. One was well, something that Subhanallah um, that popped up on on uh, you know for me on YouTube on the first day of Rajab, where it says like the special dua of Rajab on the first day of Rajab. There is no special dua whatsoever. In the authentic sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. So people might have invented something. They might have, um, you know, came up with something. But in the authentic sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, there is no such thing whatsoever. There is no special vis visits to the graves as well. Some people in the month of Rajab, they think that it's, you know, blessed to go and visit the graves in the month of Rajab. There is no, no basis to that whatsoever. So... Whatever, you, you know, uh, visiting your loved ones, the people have died in, in, um, in any month or in Rajab has nothing. There is no difference in between them. There is no special Umrah in Rajab as well. It doesn't have any specific virtue. There is no authentic hadith from the Prophet ﷺ that says Umrah is uh, more um, rewarded or, you know, it's better to do Umrah in the month of Rajab. Now, the interesting thing is we have authentic in Bukhari account from our mother Aisha saying that the Prophet ﷺ never made Umrah in Rajab. So, yani, subhanAllah, we actually have the opposite. It doesn't, yani, subhanAllah, the Prophet ﷺ is not saying don't go in Rajab, but they, he, if he, there was extra reward, he would have told the companions 
to do Umrah in Rajab specifically. Now, if you get a nice deal for Umrah that happens to be in Rajab, Alhamdulillah, yani if you plan to go and it's not your intention because it's Rajab, if, you know, if the uh, travel agent says, you know what, we have a problem with the flight, we have to delay it by another week and then it becomes outside of Rajab and then you say, no, no, I'm not going, you know, then that's a problem, right? Like, but if you just planned and it happens in Rajab, Alhamdulillah, you know, go. So it's not like to make it difficult. It's not to make it stingy, but it's to make sure that you're not coming up with something that has no basis. Like your intention here, what is it? You're going for Umrah, Alhamdulillah, you got a good deal. But if you're going for Umrah because it's in Rajab, that's the problem, basically. Ibn al-Qayyim says the Prophet ﷺ did not fast for three consecutive months, Rajab, Shaban, and Ramadan, as some people do. So this is something that's been flagged by Imam Ibn al-Qayyim, who's saying some people might be doing continuous fasting from Rajab to Shaban, and they add to it Ramadan. So he's saying the Prophet ﷺ, he never did that at all, and he never fasted Rajab at all, when he says he never fasted Rajab, he's not saying he's, he didn't. He never fasted any day in Rajab. So he never fasted the whole month of Rajab. Nor did he encourage uh, people to fast the whole month of Rajab. So this is what Ibn al-Qayyim uh, is saying. So apparently that was a case that was presented to him, and that's why he had to refute this. Omar ibn al-Khattab, yani we have this account that is... Um, uh, Authenticated by Al-Albani, Shaykh Al-Albani is saying that Umar al-Khattab used to force some people from, uh, you know, basically he forced them away from fasting. He forbade fasting for them. And he uh, used to say that this is a month that was venerated in Jahiliya. Now, the thing is, is that he might have known that those people used to venerate Rajab in Jahiliya. So he used to force them to not do that in uh you know um uh, after islam so that so that to to remove the disconnect because rajab the month of rajab used to be venerated a lot in the jahiliya days so he was trying to cut between that pagan tradition and uh the teaching of islam he was trying to make a distinction al hafiz ibn rajab wrote a whole book that is called tabayyun al ajab bima warada fi fadli rajab and the title of the book, Tabayn al-Ajab, Bima Warada Fi Fali Rajab, in other words, um, depicting the um, the strange, this is the title of the book, de de depicting the strange actions uh, that are being attributed to the virtue of the month of Rajab. So he wrote a whole book, and he said there is no Sahih Hadith, there is no authentic Hadith that may be used as the evidence um, and that has been narrated concerning the virtues of the month of Rajab, whether fasting or fasting any sp the whole month or any specific uh, part of it, or observing Qiyam al-Layl, meaning night prayer specifically during this month. Um, so, uh, and then he said, uh, Imam Abu Ismail has already stated this before me, and we have narrated this from others as well. So, uh, Habib ibn Hashar lived... Uh, uh, seven centuries after the Hijra. So he addressed this in a book because it was becoming widespread that people were doing strange things in the month of Rajab and attributing it to the virtues of the month. And he was saying there is no authentic hadith whatsoever that is pertaining to this. So, as I said, no special night and day, no, uh, subhanAllah. Um, so what can you do? So it's very clear that there is no authentic hadith what can you do in the month of Rajab that will not cause you to be, uh, subhanAllah, uh, innovating or doing bid'ah or, you know, uh, adding something extra the, uh, to the deen that can cause you to be in, in greater danger? Uh, use the month of Rajab as a time to review. The order is clear in the Quran. The ayah is clear. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us about the sacred months, he said, what do you do? You do not wrong yourself or others. So take this time to review your relationship with others, your relationship with Allah. Are you transgressing against yourself? Meaning, are you leaving some of the duties? Are you disregarding some of the teachings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Are you being heedless? Are you completely obliv oblivious of what you should be doing? Are you, what, what are your priorities? Are you focused in the wrong way? 
on the wrong things. Is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not your number one priority? Is your connection, is your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala your number one priority? Or you got other priorities that are competing or relegating that priority? Is it the priority number one or number five or number 10? Where is it? This is a time to reflect because if that's not priority number one, then we are wrong in ourselves. What is your relationship with others? So it doesn't mean that we could wrong others and ourselves and other months, but this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is given us these, these months, these kind of checkpoints so that we can stop and reflect. Yani the season of Hajj is a very, subhanAllah, uh, uh, kind of a big season and people's life change. You know, some, some families, either they will be going to Hajj, they know somebody who's going to Hajj. There is, there is a big reminder in that season. But outside of the season of Hajj, there is the month of Rajab, which is a couple of months before Ramadan, before a big season of goodness. So it's a good time to stop a couple of months of Ramadan and review what kind of issues do I have my, with my neighbors? What kind of issues do I have with my brothers and sisters? What kind of issues I have with my family? Am I wrong in them? Can I stop my harm on, you know, X, Y, Z person, right? I've been harming them over the, uh, you know, over the past year. I was, you know, taken by dunya. I was completely focused on my own self. And subhanAllah, this is the time where I can stop and reflect and then try to basically you know, check my intention, what, what I'm doing. Yani, subhanAllah, look at the recent history. Did you wrong anyone lately? So these are months, very good months for um, reviews and reflection. The thing is also the scholar that they say is like avoid sins in these months. Because they are, the scholars are saying that sinning in these months are the the uh, the punishment is even higher. So, uh, a uh, a bad deed or like a sin that you might consider as as a small sin might become a kabira in the uh, sacred months. So that's why it's very important to really restrain ourselves in these months and start purifying our hearts. And subhanAllah, if you think about it, the purpose specifically in this month, if you start reviewing, if you start uh, checking, are my, am I wrong in myself? Am I wrong in other? You are in the process of purifying your heart and you are almost like in a process of preparation for Ramadan. And subhanAllah, what, what better way to prepare for Ramadan is to start removing those hurdles, those sins that uh, have been uh, you know, we've been heedless, we've been indulgent, and over the past few months, this is kind of a, a time to stop and reflect and start basically clearing the road so that we can remove those sins and then we can replace them with good deeds in preparation for uh, Ramadan. So it's very important to stop those ongoing and recurring sins. Uh, the other point that the scholars uh, also um, mention is that wronging ourselves it's not only committing sins, but also having incorrect beliefs. For example, as I mentioned, implementing bid'ahs, you know, coming up with innovations, something that, that doesn't exist in Islam and start implementing it. That's one way to wrong ourselves, right? So you think you are doing a good deed, but you are, subhanAllah, indulging in something that has no basis in the religion. So that's one way of um, wronging ourselves. So some of the scholars, they say the month of Rajab is the month to sow the seed. The month of Shaban is the month to irrigate the crop so that we are ready in Ramadan to reap the, the harvest. The, whole, the only point that we want to stress out here is we shouldn't sow the seed with the wrong deeds, with the wrong intention, doing something that has no basis in Islam. So nothing wrong with this, as long as we are doing it in the right way, as, you know, subhanAllah. One way to sow the seed is to stop wronging myself, to stop wronging others, to start perfecting my uh, acts of worship. So taking the time to improve one's prayer, to improve one's khushua, one's concentration, to pray on time, to pray in the masjid for the brothers, uh, praying in congregation. So those are actions that are not linked to the month of Rajab, that we should strive to do them. And nothing wrong 
that this is a time, this is a sacred month. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling me, don't wrong yourself. So I stop and reflect, and then I start reviewing my prayer, and then I notice I don't have enough khushu'ah, then I'm going to start working on that. And that's an act, an action that I'm trying to carry on from now on. It's not going to stop by the end of the month of Rajab. You know, um, fasting Mondays and Thursdays. Some people will say, you know what? I was not fasting before the month of Rajab. Now you're telling me fasting is not prohibited. Then I'm not going to fast in the month of Rajab. But what if you want to start fasting Mondays and Thursdays? Like you just started and said, you know what? I, I am in a sacred month. I am uh, reviewing myself. I want to implement uh, Mondays and Thursdays fast, and I want to carry that on. Nothing wrong with that. As long as you don't come on the 30th of Rajab and say, you want, that's it, I'm done. I did it in the month of Rajab, right? So it's not something that is specific, that is tied to the month. Your intention is not tied to it. Doing dhikr as well, you know, adding dhikr, increasing dhikr, recitation of the Quran. You are not reciting, you start reciting, or you, um, you know, um, want to increase your recitation, your charitable acts, your donations, you want to do more volunteering, you want to start to plan Ramadan. Right now we are seven weeks away from uh, the beginning of the Ramadan, so you're going to start putting a plan and you start working on your weaknesses and so on. Alhamdulillah, all of that is good as long as you work on your intention and as long as it's not tied to the month of Rajab. It's not something you're going to do specifically in Rajab and then at the end of the Rajab, you're going to stop it and then you're going to move on and then you go, you're going to go back the way you were, you know, the night before Rajab, right? So that, those are things that it is recommended. We start working on them. We improve. It's a it's a journey. It's a lifelong process. It's something that we should be doing on a month, uh, on a yearly basis, like for the whole year. But if, you know, alhamdulillah, you know, Rajab started, you, you know, subhanAllah, you got the reminder, this is a sacred month. I should not wrong myself. I should not wrong others. I'm going to start working on myself. Alhamdulillah, khair. As long as your intention is clear, and then you start working on it. Now, the scholars say, um, what is the one top thing that we always indulge in that it comes under the umbrella of wronging our oneself? And subhanAllah, they highlight specifically the tongue. That it is our worst enemy in this day and age, specifically with uh, the social media. Yani, subhanAllah, right now, all those uh, hadith and those narrations, the authentic narrations from the Prophet وسلم, that are pertaining to the dangers of the tongue, apply to what you write and what you say and what you like and what you share on social media as well. So the impact is becoming exponential. That's that that's the problem right now. That you see that um, you know people um, would be you know hurting others they will be shaming others they will be slandering others they will be cursing and putting down people and some people even they can you know put people down to the point that on the other side somebody halfway around the world they can go and commit suicide because of what they told them on social media so the impact of what we are doing in social media is exponential sometime before you know you before the era of social media and so on, you could say something about someone, a slander or a backbite. You're going to tell it to a physical person in front of you. And that physical person might spread it in the school, in your school, right? Like, let's assume you go to school. So they might spread it in a school where there is like 200 students, 500 students, whatever, right? Right now, you put it on social media, it's going to go to millions of people sometimes. So the impact is exponential. If you're doing something good, the impact is exponential. If you're doing something bad, the impact is exponential. So that's why the scholars, they highlight this as one of the things to work on to not wrong ourselves. The number one thing to review, the Prophet وسلم, in a hadith that is narrated by Abu Huraira, that all of you know, where the Prophet وسلم, asked the companions, do you know who is the bankrupt? And then the companion said, the one who hasn't, uh, money or mata'a or properties then the Prophet ﷺ said no that's not what I mean the real bankrupt of my ummah is the one who comes on the day of uh, resurrection he has salah he has uh, uh, fasting he has charity he has all those kind of good deeds but he will find himself bankrupt because he reviled others he 
basically attacked others. He took the wealth of others. He shed the bloods of others. He beat others. He hurt them with his tongue. Subhanallah, the easiest sin that he could do, subhanallah, is say something and then it will hurt others. So his good deed will be distributed to others. And then those people that he wronged, that he harmed, they will come one by one. They will get his good deed. And then when his good deeds are depleted, then they will take their bad deeds and then they will put, put them on him and then he will be thrown in the hell fire. Why? Where does it start? What's the easiest sin that can lead to this? Is what we say and what we write on social media. In another long hadith that I shared with you before, that is a discussion between the Prophet وسلم, and Mu'adh ibn Jabal. The Prophet وسلم, is telling Mu'adh ibn, uh, ibn Jabal about the doors of goodness in Islam. And he was telling him about you know fasting and praying the night and so on and so forth. And then the Prophet ﷺ tried to summarize it for him at the end of the hadith. So I'm just hearing with you the end of the hadith. Where the Prophet ﷺ said, Should I not tell you about the head and the support of the matter and the top of its hump? Should I just give you the summary of this? So Umar said, Of course, Ya Rasulullah. So the Prophet said, The head of the matter is Islam. Its support is Salah. And the top of its hump is Jihad. So then... Uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said, Shall I not inform you of the controlling of all that? What does control all of that? Subhanallah. Then Mu'a said, Of course, Ya Rasulullah, let me, tell me. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam took his tongue and then he said, Restrain this. So Mu'a was surprised. He said, Ya Rasulullah, shall we really be punished from what we talk about? Then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, which is a statement in Arabic that shows the surprise of the Prophet وسلم, that Mu'adh didn't know this. So he said, I'm surprised that you, Mu'adh, will anything but, but the harvest of the tongues overthrow men in hell on their, their faces? So anything, will anything but the harvest of the tongues? Included in that is what we do in social media. Subhanallah. So it can be really something that will take us to the highest level or something that will drop us um, to the low, lowest pits of uh, hellfire. And it's just something as easy as what we utter with our own mouth. So the question to you is, will you give your hard-earned money to someone who does not deserve it? Yani, let's imagine in this life, somebody you know, you have a neighbor who is squandering his money, he's gambling, you know, he's, he's always drunk, he's irresponsible, he's not taking hold of his life, and he comes to you and he says, you know what, I want to borrow $5,000. You know he's going to take the money and he's going to go and gamble, gamble with it. Would you give him your hard-earned money? And you know he's not going to give it back. Yani all of you will say easy. No, I will not give him anything. Subhanallah. The thing is, is we are willing to give away the most valuable possessions that we have on the day of judgment to people that we completely disregard, disregard in this dunya. Some, some of the people that will be stepping in on the day of judgment and they will be taking our most valuable possessions, which is our good deeds, are people who we hated the most in this dunya. Subhanallah. That we wouldn't give them a dollar in this dunya. But we are willing to give them our most valuable possessions on the day of judgment. Subhanallah. Just because we couldn't restrain our tongues. Just because our ego stepped in the way. Just because we couldn't, you know, not say whatever we said in social media and whatever, right? So we just need to put things in perspective, subhanAllah. So we, we need to take advantage of these seasons of goodness so that we can hasten in repentance. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuha al-ladheena amanu tubu ila Allahi tawbatan nasuha. 
عسى ربكم أن يكفر عنكم سيئاتكم ويدخلكم جنات تجري من تحتها الأنهار يوم لا يخزي الله النبي والذين آمنوا معه نورهم يسعى بين أيديهم وبأيمانهم يقولون ربنا أتمم لنا نورنا واغفر لنا إنك على كل شيء قدير Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O believers, turn to Allah in sincere repentance. So your Lord may absolve you of your sins and admit you into gardens, under which rivers flow on the day Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not disgrace the Prophet or the believers with him. Their light will shine ahead of them and on their right. They will say, Our Lord, perfect our light for us and forgive us. For you are truly most capable of everything. So, subhanAllah, this is this ayah again, it's a general ayah. So, it's talking about the tawbah, it's talking about repentance. But it's more so we need to hasten in repentance, specifically in these times, in the sacred month. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us, don't wrong yourself, don't wrong others. So, we stop, we review. If we, subhanAllah, establish, and all of us, you know, we are wronging ourselves in one way or the other. Then we stop and then we do repentance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We go back to Allah and then we fulfill the conditions of the repentance where we stop whatever sin, whatever act that we were indulging in. We say, Ya Allah, we are stopping. We're going to stop this sin. And then we will make a firm uh, uh, a niya, a firm intention that we will not go back to the sin. And then we will feel remorse. We will feel pain. So basically... That's the most important part is that when we review, when we do this session where we sit down and review, then we will feel the pain is how can how come the remorse? How come I did this? How come? And then we feel that pain in the heart. That's when our repentance will be accepted. That's the most important condition. Because as I said before, is we could be sitting in the corner and then we could be saying, Astaghfirullah, 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 Astaghfirullah while we are holding the phone and then we are scrolling through our social media so the tongue is there the heart is not there subhanallah the uh, complete repentance is that when whatever we are saying with the tongue is also felt by the heart subhanallah yani if um, one of the scholars yani presented it very well if i sit in front of you if i say something wrong to you and then i sit in front of you and then i tell you I'm sorry, 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 like a thousand times. Wouldn't you be more mad? And you would you be telling me like, that's not sincere, subhanAllah. But that's what we do with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is we sit there and then we say, astaghfirullah, 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 astaghfirullah. And then we say it a thousand times in the most and the fastest way without even meaning any of it, subhanAllah. So it's, it's the process of, you know, take it in all in and then feeling what we are doing, and then establishing that in the heart, we committed something, we, we wronged ourselves, we wronged others, and then this is the time to stop, to think about it, to reflect upon it, to uh, feel some pain and remorse because we did it, and then start a new pace saying, Ya Allah, I'm stopping it, I'm not going back to it, and then I do it before, uh, you know, uh, I die, before death, subhanAllah, or before the end of times subhanallah and then part of that is that if i transgressed about against some something someone else if i wronged someone else if i took the right of someone else then i go and then i give them back the right their rights if i can so if the possibility is there to give the rights to people uh, then i should do everything possible to be able to do that subhanallah so those are the conditions of the repentance the last question I want to ask you is, do you want to risk being turned away from the Prophet ﷺ? The reason why I'm asking this question is because, um, because of why, you know, the reason I started with this halaqa is sometimes we get in a, a, a fake seasons of goodness. Sometimes people or like shaitan or ourselves, others, we get deceived into doing things that have no basis in Islam. And then we would start coming up with excuses that my, you know, X, Y, Z person, my ex sheikh my, uh, you know, um, uh, family, my forefathers, whatever, they were doing this, so I'm going to do this. 
Um, and subhanAllah, or like I'm doing it because I love the Prophet wasallam. I love Allah and his Prophet and that's why I'm doing this, subhanAllah. And so in the beginning, we established that if we want to prove our love to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to his Prophet, then we should follow the teaching of the Prophet wasallam. And following the teaching of the Prophet wasallam through his authentic sunnah will earn us the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we really, we don't want to take the risk of being turned turned away by the Prophet Sallallahu when we would be rushing, we would be in a position to be rushing to the Prophet Sallallahu to hug him, to meet him for the first time, and then instead of doing that, we would be taken away. There would be angels taken taken us away. Billah. may Allah protect us from that outcome. The Prophet Sallallahu in a hadith that is narrated by Abu Huraira. The Prophet Sallallahu went to the graveyard, and then he said salam to. Uh, the people who, who are dead. So um, he said, peace be upon upon you. So, and then he said, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, I love to see my brothers. So the companions, they said, Ya Rasulullah, aren't we your brothers? So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, you are my companions, but my brothers and our brothers. So in some in one narration, he says, my brothers. In another narration, he says, our brothers are those who have so far not come into the words. So there are people that will come later that will believe in the Prophet ﷺ without seeing him. So the companions, they were uh, intrigued. They asked the Prophet ﷺ, how would you recognize those people uh, since you were not, you did not see them? So the Prophet ﷺ gave them an imagery. He said, suppose a man had horses with white blazes on foreheads and legs among ho uh, horses which were all black. So these horses, you know, these special horses, they had white blazes on their foreheads and their legs. And they were among a group of horses that were black. So the Prophet ﷺ asked the companions, Would, do you think he will recognize his horses? The Sahaba said, of course, Ya Rasulullah, certainly the, uh, that he will be able to do so. So the Prophet ﷺ said, they will come, meaning the, the, the Muslims, and the Muslima who will believe in the Prophet ﷺ without seeing him, who follow the right teaching of the Prophet ﷺ, they would come with white faces and arms and legs uh, because of the uh, wudu, because of the ablution. And I would arrive at the fountain, at the hawth, at al kautha before them. And then some people, then this is the point that I want to highlight, some of them would be driven away from the fountain, from the hawth, as the stray camel is dri driven away. And then the Prophet ﷺ would be looking at them. He recognized them, and then he sees them going away, and he will be saying, come, come. But he would be told, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, it would be said to me, these people changed after you. And that's when the Prophet ﷺ would say, sahkan, sahkan, badan, badan. Be off, be off. This is an authentic hadith in Muslim where the Prophet Sallallahu is highlighting the dangers of going on the wrong path, of not checking, of not double checking, of, uh, you know, following uh, some, some um, you know, kind of uh, um, basically um, kind of teachings or routes that are not authentic, that SubhanAllah following our own whims and desires when it comes to matter of religion. That's why in the matters of religion, we need to go back to the authentic. Do we have any authentic hadith? And if somebody, if you are doing something, you know, that is not authentic, that has no basis in Islam, and somebody comes to you and presenting you with an authentic narration from the Prophet ﷺ, with the clear proof, then we should say, Sama'na we obey what the Prophet ﷺ is teaching us. As soon as we receive authentic explanation, an authentic hadith from the Prophet ﷺ, and it, it's made very clear, then Alhamdulillah, that's it. We should not let anyone deceive and drive us away from the teaching of the Prophet ﷺ. And I'll take you back to the ayah that I started with, ayah 31 in Surah Ali Amran. قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهَ فَاتَّبِعُونِ يُحْبِبُكُمُ اللَّهُ وَيَخْتُرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ وَاللَّهُ غَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ Say, O Prophet, if you sincerely love Allah, then follow me. Allah will love you and forgive your sins, for Allah is all forgiven most merciful, subhanAllah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inherently loves us. And I'll close with this example, that if you 
um, you have a loved one who's, let's say he's going to a conference in the US and let's say he's going to a place, you know, the conference is happening in one of the places where we have, there was a recent mass shootings in the past few days, may Allah protect us. So if that loved one is going into a conference in that area, what would you tell them? You will tell them, call me as soon as you get there. And every day you should call me and then make sure that I am, uh, you know, I know that you are safe. At least once a day, call me. Now, let us let me ask you, how about if your loved one is going to Ukraine, where there is a war right now? How many times a day you would ask them to call you? One, two times, three times, four times, every couple of hours. Why? Because you love that person and you want to make sure that they are safe. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala set the salah for us, not to make it hard for us, but to show us that he loves us. He wants us to come back to him as many times a day as possible. Five times a day, we are being called to go back to Allah. Yani if you take that analogy, this is, this is an act of love, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves us, and he wants us to go back to him on a daily basis, five times a day, to reconnect with him, to go back to him and tell him, how is the day going? What is bothering us? What do we like about it? What do we want more of it? What do we want go to go away from it? SubhanAllah. Five times a day, going back to Allah and reconnecting with Him. Are we doing it in that way? Or is it just a burden that we really want to get rid of? SubhanAllah. Again, let me remind you, if we love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we should follow the teaching of Allah, of the Prophet sallallahu That's how we affirm that we love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. أقول قولي هذا سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك. Um, if there are any questions, otherwise we can stop here, insha'Allah. Jazakum Allah khairan for your time.